Uh, hi, Sudam. Yeah, you can hear me. Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Ah, hi. Yeah. I have to check that it's working fine or not. Yeah, it's live too in YouTube. I guess we are about to start. And your slides are ready. Could you check that if your um, slide is working fine? And uh, can you do the full screen? Control L. Yes. All right, it's fine. Yeah, you can unshare it. Uh, let's everybody come. Right. Are you seeing the unshare mode? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, Elena, you can unmute yourself and I guess it's time. You are a moderator for this talk. I guess, yeah. This is you. 
it's me. Ah, no, 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 yes, no, it's, it's, no, you for the, the, sorry, sorry, yes, 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 <laughs> sorry, agree. So we are waiting for her. <laughs> hmm. Oh, well, in, in order to delay too much, maybe yeah, you can present uh, Monsi and the, the discussion session is, is presented by Elena. Um, so I would like to invite another uh, speaker, uh, uh, Monsi John. He's from uh, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala, India. And his talk, on, his talk will be on modified cosmology and gravity theories. Monsi. You can share your screen. Thank you, Sadam. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah we loud and clear. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can we share the screen? Okay. Okay. Uh, So my talk is on uh, nuances of costing cosmologies. Uh, by costing cosmology, what do you mean is the scale factor of full, varying, full screen. Uh, pardon? Full screen. Full screen. Full screen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the costing cosmological models. Uh, by costing, what we mean is the scale factor varying linearly with time. And we are considering only the FRW cosmological models for the time being. In the background uh, space time, uh, the background universe. So the condition, we note that the zero active gravitational mass condition is Rossi squared. Recording in progress. Degrees, uh, So the zero IT gravitational mass condition is rho c squared plus 3p equal to zero. This condition can be uh, equivalent to the equation state thus p equal to minus 1 by 3 rho c squared. The solution of the Friedman equation in this case is a equal to mct, which is varying linearly with time. m is a dimensionless constant. c is speed of light, m is square root of k by omega minus 1 where omega is the total density parameter. Uh, we can take all the three curvature parameter values, k equal to zero, plus or minus one. The special geometry can be closed, open, or flat in this case. Regarding the value of m, we can see that it is equal to one when omega equal to zero. In that case, we have to take k equal to minus one. So looking at the equation, m can be equal to one. Similarly, when omega equal to 1, we can again, uh, k should be equal to 0, so there is a possibility for putting m equal to 1. And for omega equal to 2, there is k equal to plus 1, so that again, uh, in these three cases, we have m equal to 1. But in other cases, normally, m is a uh, parameter, it's a free parameter, it can take even infinite values, nearly infinite values, as omega tends to one. So let us now consider some special cases of this. If you are considering only the single component cosmic fluid, in that case, the equation state parameter is minus 1 by 3, that is rho 
very sus a to the power minus 2 but this kind of a uh, component is exotic and such a model is not physical another special case is that of an empty model where rho equal to 0 k should be equal to minus 1 and you can write a equal to c t but of course this is unphysical for it is an empty model thirdly there is a matter anti matter symmetric cosmology uh, anti matter has negative anti gravitational mass so the total anti gravitational mass will be zero but uh, there is no direct evidence for this scenario instead if you have two components in the cosmic fluid there is a possibility for a viable cosmological model which we call the eternal cosmic model here rho is the sum of a matter term and a lambda term the cosmological constant the corresponding pressures are also uh, pm and p lambda the sum of this pm is the matter equation state uh, with the w and the p lambda has the equation state parameter minus 1 we can take k get the plus one or minus one or zero if you are considering the zero actually gravitational mass condition this uniquely gives the ratio between densities of matter and lambda or the ratio between density parameters between matter and lambda equal to 2 by 1 plus 3 w where w can be zero or 1 by 3 so this ratio should remain a constant that means both matter and lambda densities must vary as a to the power minus 2 to keep this ratio a constant and that ratio is a constant of the order of 1 so there is no uh, uh, coincidence problem in this model uh, because of this matter and lambda varying as a to the power minus 2 uh, the components cannot be separately considered because matter should vary as a to the power minus 3 and the rho lambda should remain a constant but in this case they are not separately considered there can be there can be creation of matter as lambda decays uh, this model was discussed in this paper and let me now uh, consider the other eternal question models discussed in the literature the classic milne model of 1935 it is a non generalizationistic model uh, it has a general linear expansion uh, but it is not a realistic model uh, because it does not con- consider even gravity even in the very early epochs gravity is not uh, considered to be contributing to the uh, cosmic evolution another uh, eternal cosmic model is the rhcl to ct model shev milia and shev took in 2012 Uh, we have k equal to zero. Uh, this is actually the k equal to zero case of the eternal Cauchy model. And recently, there is the hyperconical model by Monjo in 2017. It can take all values k equal to plus or minus one or zero, and it is eternal Cauchy. But when considered to these eternal Cauchy models, there are certain quasi-eternal Cauchy models. That is, the Wasserthaha model. with the k equal to plus 1 is quasi linear that is it is linear or uh, this eternal uh, sorry this this uh, linear or costing only in the early universe similarly the cold and chen wu models in 1899 and 1990 they have k equal to plus or minus 1 and 0 they are quasi linear and costing only in the late universe in this case i would like to consider one more model the bouncing and costing model which has the scale factor very as this expression here a not is the minimum uh, size of the universe at t equal to zero uh, that initial moments can be considered to be a quantum epoch but in the classical epoch that is when ct much greater than a not this is eternal costing with the k equal to plus 1 uh, this bouncing and costing model was discussed in these papers please note that uh, these papers appeared even before the uh, supernova data came in 
1998. Uh, graphical uh, way of looking at this is this. We have an, a previous contracting phase for such a model. Uh, a bounce happens at nearly the plant time, and thereafter it evolves uh, in a costing manner. Now we will discuss the solution of cosmological problems in this models in general cost uh, the costing models uh, the models we discussed so far are all singular except the bouncing and costing model so we can say there is no cost sing non uh, singularity problem in the bouncing and costing model and there is no uh, singularity problem in this model regarding the flatness problem and the horizon problem we know that in the lambda cdm model these problems are solved due to inflation. But uh, in this model, the eternal costing model, the total density, including individual components, all vary as a to the power minus two. So uh, it can have k equal to plus, plus one or minus one, and there is no fine tuning problem here. Hence, there is no flatness problem. Similarly, the horizon problem is absent in the eternal costing model. A more serious problems in the lambda CDM model are the cosmological constant, the coincidence, and the fine tuning problems. The origin of these problems can be seen from this diagram. In the lambda CDM model, the radiation and matter terms vary as in the blue line, but the vacuum energy, the brown line, Vacuum energy falls from a very huge value of 10 to the power 94 gram per centimeter cube to an abysmally small value of 10 to the power minus 29 gram per centimeter cube. And that is in the very small time uh, of inflation of the order of 10 to the power minus 35 seconds. But thereafter, this vacuum energy or the lambda tail or the dark energy with this small, very small value should continue as a constant, as in the red line, and only in the present epoch, they are nearly equal. So this is uh, actually a very uh, extreme coincidence, can be only an extreme coincidence. And uh, especially the vacuum behaving in this particular way can be achieved only by some extreme fine tuning. So this is the origin of these problems. Uh, but in the eternal costing model, since all vacuum and uh, ordinary matter are all varying as a to the power minus two, there is no coincidence. There is no cosmological constant problem. There is no coincidence problem, or there is no fine tuning problem in this case. Uh, one serious problem with the lambda CDM model is the synchronicity problem. The synchronicity problem can be understood from this diagram. Here, the uh, red curve represents the evolution of the scale factor in the lambda CDM model. One can see that at present, if you draw a tangent to the curve, that curve may meet exactly the point of the moment of Big Bang origin. Uh, mathematically, this condition can be written as ht equal to 1. So the situation in the lambda CDM model is that the tangent can meet the Big Bang origin, and that happens only once in its history, and that is precisely now. But in the eternal costing model, ht equal to 1 is a prediction, because the evolution is, evolution is linear. So this is a prediction. So there is no synchronicity problem in the lambda, in the eternal costing model. Uh, lastly, we consider some cosmological observations. A very important observation is that of the type 1 supernova. Uh, in the lambda stadium model, this uh, unnatural dimming of type 1 supernova is interpreted as due to a late accelerated expansion of the universe. To see how it reaches that conclusion, let us look at this equation for the luminosity distance. We have to do this integral, and on the left hand side of this integral, you have to do, you have to uh, put the expression for scale factor as a function of time. 
in the lambda cd model a of t is expressed in terms of omega m and omega lambda and the analysis gives values of omega m and omega lambda such that that indicates accelerated expansion however this analysis can be considered only as a model independent model dependent analysis what do you mean by a model independent analysis is this instead of a scale factor a of t as a solution of a friedman equation we can think of a of t as a taylor expansion about some time t0 so the equation will be like this we can uh, truncate the series to some finite uh, number of terms there are the parameters in this model h not is the present value of hubble parameter q not is the present value of deceleration parameter r not s not etc and in these two papers in 2004 and 2005 the bias theorem was used to evaluate each of these parameters by marginalizing the likelihood function of the rest of the parameters and what we see the result is this in 2003 the 54 all scp supernovae was used as the data and the analysis was done the margin likelihood for deceleration parameter was obtained in this way one can see that q0 equal to 0 there is a significant margin likelihood even for q0 equal to 0 and that was in 2003 uh the paper was published in 2005 but two minutes later left. another data the constitution data the constitution data was used and what we see that uh, there is a very significant high value of uh, likelihood for the value q q0 equal to 0 so this supports the eternal cost model and lastly i want to mention the very bright galaxies of cebus Uh, James Webb Space Telescope. The recent observations of early bright galaxies with the AWS Tier case that in the universe galaxy formation has taken place much earlier than expected in the lambda CD model. This is the problem with the early galaxies uh, in the lambda CD model. The significant papers are this, and uh, there are redshifts 13.2 12 point galaxies which are spectroscopically confirmed. as is equal to 13.2 set so, uh, 12.6 and so on. so the problem with these uh, galaxies the farthest galaxies ever observed is that in order to in order for them to appear in such a massive manner uh, over a million solar masses they might have built up their masses in only less than 300 to 400 mega year after the big bang as per the calculations in the lambda cd but the same hubble parameter value can be used see this is quite unexpected as per the current understanding of galaxy formation if the same h not value is used on the other hand in the eternal costing model even a universe at redshift is equal to has ample time that is 1070 mega years for galaxy form and this suggests that in the early universe too data support the eternal costing model when compared to the lambda cd model i stop here uh, questions are now welcome thank you all thank you monsi so any questions so i think eric has a question yeah we have Well, ten minutes left for the questions. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Can people hear me? Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Uh, so my question is: in any expanding model, we can use the Tolman test of surface brightness to distinguish between expansion and non-expansion. so the for both the hubble results and now for the james webb space telescope results 
there is absolutely no difference in the surface brightness, which is an observed, uh, directly observed quantity for galaxies at high redshift up to uh, now up to eight or 10 and galaxies in the local uh, at uh, z equals zero. So this seems like a clear cut contradiction of any expanding model. How, uh, how does coasting uh, cosmology deal with this contradiction in surface brightness? Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I can't uh, comment on that, uh, the astrophysical part of that question. Uh, actually, we have discussed the uh, calculations as per the papers uh, on uh, early bright galaxies. Such details, I am sorry, I can't uh, comment. You, you haven't looked at this data? First slide. Hello? Yes. Yes, sir? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, there was some comment or maybe question. What could be the signature of costing model in CMB? Can we constrain uh, oh. these parameters using, let's say, Planck data set? Uh, actually, the RHCL CT model by Melia uh, and collaborators have worked on a lot of uh, cosmological observations, including CMB. Uh, so the early universe as per the, the lambda studio model or the uh, eternal positive model is yet to be worked out uh, because in my opinion uh, this particular case all the components in the cosmological uh, cosmos will be as a to the power of minus two so that is uh, the basic ansatz we have used to arrive at the eternal cost model. So in that case, all components, including lambda uh, or matter or radiation, whatever, must vary as a to the power minus two means the early universe must be uh, reworked in this model. And uh, many things are yet to be worked out. In the uh, RHCL to CT model, the variation is different. So I cannot compare uh, this with the uh, RHGL to CT in that case, early universities. So uh, this part is not yet worked out uh, for the eternal costing model. All right. Indranil want to ask something. Indranil wants to ask something. Yeah, Indranil. Uh, yes. So I, I wanted to ask a related question, which is uh, you probably not want it either, but uh, it's related to the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So um, do, how does that work in this model? Like, uh, do you have any idea? Like, or do you get A proportional to T even in the first few minutes of the, of the universe in this model? In this model. Yeah. 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 In this model, that is. So, so throughout the throughout same scale factor, I'm getting an echo, sorry. Uh, throughout the uh, evolution of the scale factor, uh, evolution of the universe, the scale factor yeah. is the same, a proportion to T. And uh, all components in the cosmic fluid, there can be creation of matter from lambda. That is one important aspect of this model. So okay. uh, there is no, no yet, not yet any uh, complete discussion of nuclear synthesis or other uh, uh, cosmological observations. In this model, uh, only the uh, large scale behavior is studied. Not the details are not yet worked out. Can I ask the question related to the late universe in that case? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so uh, w which of the tensions we were discussing earlier can be addressed in with with a model like this? So, if, for example, regarding the faster growth of structure, 
uh, in the KVC void or in Elgato um, at uh, Redshift 1, uh, approximately. Um, would, would these models help with that at all? Because the age of the universe would be much the same, right, in, in this model, right? Uh, the age of the universe is given by, uh, actually, a characteristic expression for this model is ht equal to 1. Because the yeah, exactly. Of so the age of the universe will be much the same yeah. as in Lambda CDM, right, uh, today. But would you be able to... No, actually, uh, it's approximately the same, maybe slightly well, it's more within a few percent. The Lambda CDM. Yeah, it, 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 that's that's within a few percent. But what I was asking is like, would it help with anything at the perturbation level? So regarding the growth of structures in the universe, would, would these models be able to help with explaining the the um, KVC void or the El Gordo cluster? Yeah, I think they are all uh, problems uh, really worth discussing in this model. But uh, those details are not worked out for this year. Yes. Okay. By Melia, I think uh, something is, is made. By Melia. Yeah, Melia has done a lot of work. Uh, that is a, a special case of K equal to uh, plus one. Uh, sorry, K equal to zero case of the eternal costing model. But uh, even though it is that uh, special case, a lot of cosmological observations are uh, studied and analyzed by Melia. And some question by Juan. Yeah, you can unmute yourself and ask. Yeah. Uh, hi, Bonzi. Hi. Could you co comment on the possibility that uh, the universe uh, behaves as, as a huge black hole, which uh, mass is uh, rising uh, as uh, is radius uh, as energy. actually that can be, yeah, yeah. Energy. okay okay uh, actually that calculation uh, contains very uh, peculiar and very significant uh, information that observation is very important but uh, regarding the i think uh, coincidence for me i can uh, why, how to connect it with the black hole uh, situation, uh, I'm not clear, so. Thank you. Maurice wants to ask something. Yeah, if I understood it correctly, you also take the um, this approach down to the early uh, stages of the universe, this uh, coasting yes. solution, is that correct? Right, that's right. But, yeah. but then how do you satisfy the observed BAO angle? Because that depends on having an exact uh, timing in the uh, service of last uh, scattering. Yeah, I told you this. Uh, the, such details of the model are such, apart from the RH equal to CT model, uh, these details are not worked out in the percent model. So, uh, it's some from some basic uh, arguments. It's the modified Chen Wu and sets that we arrived at this model. Uh, that the scale factor in the classical epoch, in the class in the uh, quantum epoch, we can have a different evolution. Uh, that is uh, much when the scale factor is much greater than uh, the Planck length, but uh, otherwise. It is costing. Uh, that is the conclusion we have reached from that answer. Uh, but the details have to be worked out. I, sorry, I can't say. Yes, does one want to ask something? Yes, I think it's from the previous question, I think. So. Yeah, move on to. Yeah, Pavel wants to ask something. So you, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I was just uh, wondering. I uh, do you th this model um, still requires a dark matter, right? Um, yeah. That's right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be there. Yeah. Okay. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. 
So, so, so the same caveat applies to, as I said before, um, the problem with the dynamical friction. Yes, that's right. <laughs> These are only the global features which I have described, not uh, the fine details. Any questions? Any more questions? Yes, Robert. Uh, just a, a, a comment. Uh, the, the the major critic critical point of of this uh, uh, type of model, costing model, is of the zero active uh, con, uh, gravitational mass condition, and uh, the solution for this is to change the general relativity. Uh, to be valid only for perturbations uh, uh, respect with respect to the, uh, the background uh, metric. So the, the background metric is evolving uh, by, by itself as a geometrical uh, manifold and uh, the, um, the void, the the dark one, well, the energy of the space time, space time is not affecting, uh, is not affecting to the to the linear expansion. So, uh, dark matter and dark energy is are irrelevant in this type of models. Yes, Robert. Yes, Robert. Yes, Robert. Yes, Robert. Yes, Right. Ah, it's a comment. Sorry, it's yeah. a comment. Sorry, it's a comment. Yeah, complement. Any more questions? If no, okay, then we um, thank you, Monsi, and then we move to thank our you. next speaker. Uh, if I'm pronouncing correctly, uh, Kyu Hyun Cha, and he's from Sejong University, South Korea, and his talk is. Title of his talk is Observational Evidence for Mon Type Gravity from Gaia Observations of Wide Binary Stars. Yes. Hello. Hello, Kyu Hyun. Hi. Nice to see you. Hello, everyone. Uh, Okay. Uh, Is there any problem? Uh, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, white binaries uh, has been probably the, one of the hottest topics in astronomy and astrophysics for the past six months or so. So uh, I think this will be an uh, exciting time to discuss uh, the current issues. Okay, so uh, we have when we have observed apparent binaries, uh, it can be pure binary uh, without any additional component, or it can be a hierarchical system, and uh, we have to deal with the three D motion to the observed motion. So what we observe is uh, the, the apparent motion on the plane of the sky, although the actual motion is in the 3D space. So what? Uh, so we have this uh, relative velocity in 3D space and also relative velocity on the sky. And what we observe is uh, sky projected separation and sky projected velocity uh, that come from proper motions and here because uh, apparent binaries can be either pure binary or a hierarchical system uh, and uh, in general we do not know uh, the, the, the ratio so we have to uh, assume our parameter uh, I'll call it FMRT and then 
uh, this parameter has to be calibrated or uh, determined from the modeling. Okay. So uh, in the literature, including my recent papers, uh, one can basically consider three methods. Okay, so uh, with uh, relative velocity and uh, relative separation and total mass in 3D space, if they can be inferred, of course, they cannot be uh, observed directly. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but if they can be inferred, then gravity can be tested by this uh, uh, V square over R. I'll call it kinematic acceleration. And uh, uh, at Newtonian acceleration, we of course know Newtonian gravity. So if the motion is circular, then these two will be the same. Uh, that's uh, here. When eccentricity is zero, then they are essentially the same. So if gravity is Newtonian, then we will always have uh, a ratio of one. Uh, but uh, what we observe are uh, projected quantities. And uh, uh, for one system, uh, we don't measure these uh, quantities directly. So uh, if we have some knowledge, then we can distribute observed binaries on the G and GN plane. And, uh, and then we can compare the observed distribution in the plane with the distribution predicted by Newtonian gravity. And if the agreement is good, then the game is over. So we don't need to do any further analysis because it already agrees with uh, Newtonian gravity. So uh, that's the uh, key thing to do. I'll, I'll call this method acceleration plane method. And uh, uh, it was actually inspired by the radial acceleration relation test of in galactic rotation data. Uh, but actually, uh, one can also consider the ratio rather than the, the plane itself. One can consider, consider the ratio versus Newtonian acceleration. Actually, this is reminiscent of a mass discrepancy acceleration relation. It was uh, considered uh, before radial acceleration relation. Then actually, this uh, acceleration relation becomes velocity ratio or uh, measured 3D velocity and uh, Newtonian circular velocity. And also this uh, uh, Newtonian gravity, uh, if it is uh, uh, normalized by A naught, then uh, it becomes R over Rm. Here Rm is the moon radius. So uh, one can consider uh, V over Vc versus R over Rm. But uh, this V and R are not measured. So uh, in these uh, cases, one has to deal with uh, some uh, Monte Carlo deprojection from observed quantities to 3D quantities. So in this Monte Carlo, uh, one has to take into account all possibilities, eccentricity and the orbital phase, inclination. Uh, okay. Now, uh, without a deprojection, uh, if one doesn't want to the, the projection, then one can uh, use the projected velocity uh, divided by circular velocity at the projected radius, not at the physical radius. So this this is called V tilde. Uh, it is uh, used by many people in the literature. So this will be the proxy for V over VCR. And then S over Rm can be a fraction for R over Rm. So one can consider V tilde versus S over Rm relation. Uh, but actually, some people uh, like Indra Neil and uh, uh, Pitodis and Sutherland, they consider actually V tilde versus S without normalizing S with Rm. Uh, so I'll call this uh, a normalized velocity analysis, and uh, this is in preparation. 
Uh, okay, and then the last method will be uh, the velocity profile. Uh, so one just uh, consider distribution of observed uh, velocity, the projected velocity with respect to projected separation. This will be the, the simplest uh, analysis. And then uh, I, I call it stacked velocity profile analysis. It can work for, for systems uh, of uh, pure binaries of uh, similar masses. Uh, so uh, if this is the orbital motion, then uh, when we observe as an inclination, then uh, we have this relation, the relation between projected velocity and the real 3D relative velocity and uh, uh, the projected separation versus uh, 3D a separation. Okay, so uh, from observed four promotions, we can calculate sky projected, uh, 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 we can calculate sky, sky projected velocity. So if uh, 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 an apparent binary is determined to be gravitationally found, uh, I mean a true binary, then actually they can be assumed to be at the same distance because the distance is much, much larger than the separation. Although they are wide, wide binary, it is uh, uh, here we are talking about less than 0.1 parsec. Uh, so, uh, so it is, uh, so at 100 parsec, 0.1 parsec is uh, uh, one to 1,000. So uh, it is a very small value. So we can assume they are at the same distance. So so basically this uh, uh, projected uh, 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 the, the, the proper motion, scalar proper motion becomes basically projected velocity. And likewise, the, the, the Newton predicted Projected velocity also can be related to the 3D velocity, and then using the T projection, we can have this uh, uh, relation. So here, uh, S and M are measured quantities, but all the other parameters here appearing are unknown. So they have to be drawn uh, using Monte Carlo method. Uh, okay, so uh, one key parameter is uh, eccentricities. So uh, for binaries, I'm using uh, eccentricities uh, have been constrained by Huang et al. So for each binary, I have a range of eccentricity. Uh, I have a range of eccentricity. So, so I can uh, uh, use that range rather than uh, using a blind range. Okay, so one can also consider some uh, statistical distribution uh, rather than individual ranges. Okay, now a uh, binary sample that comes from Gaia data release 3. So uh, this would be just the initial candidate, initial candidate pair within one kiloparsec, that's like 100 million. Now, uh, here, uh, what to do? Oh, okay, that's where people can have different opinions. And uh, these people, everybody right there, they remove clusters. So initially, it is like this. So you can see uh, a lot of uh, things uh, are clustered on the galactic plane, but they remove clusters and background pairs and resolve the triples. Uh, okay, so that's the main thing then. You are left with the 1.8 million binary candidates. So here now one has to deal with the chance alignment fly flyby cases. So uh, what can you do here? Okay. So uh, these people they uh, uh, use some um, develop an empirical method to remove flybys. Okay. So they develop a parameter. And then actually their paper, uh, I, I think uh, probably uh, about half of their paper is about this uh, chance alignment probability. So, uh, but uh, one can also uh, uh, 
to uh, other methods. So basically, one can require the binary candidate pair at the same distances, although they have the same radial velocities. But not all of them have radial velocities. So uh, this this method, the second method, can be applied to only a, sam uh, a subsample. Oh, okay. Now, uh, here I'm showing results, uh, the most updated result uh, uh, for uh, uh, using the acceleration plane method. So uh, the, the upper panels show uh, the sample, the sample removing chance alignment using this R parameter. And the second panel shows uh, results for a sample removing chance alignment by distances and radial velocities. And, so, and this uh, FMRT is uh, uh, determined by requiring uh, this uh, high acceleration being matches Newtonian. Okay, so here I'm showing the uncertainties, the upper and the lower uncertainty here at the same. So if samples are selected in different way, then you see it is F multi values are different. Uh, that's uh, natural because if your sample, sample selection is different, then you expect uh, different uh, uh, fraction of hierarchical systems. And what it shows is uh, striking. I mean, it's incredible. You know, when I saw this result about uh, maybe eight months ago, uh, or seven or eight months ago, I was like, I was dreaming. You can see this alone, it is well above five sigma. You see, how can this happen? I, I have never seen this kind of thing in my career, uh, 20 plus career. So this figure changed actually my opinion completely. You know, when I got some results uh, for or rotation curves, well, I got impressed, uh, but they didn't they they didn't change my opinion completely. I was kind kind of half minded. Wow, modified gravity moon is very impressive, but I cannot, you know, change my mind completely. But when I saw this figure, that changed my mind completely. So I now regard myself completely moved or modified gravity supporter. Because, you know, this is not a joke, uh, you see. And here, with the different sampling, uh, okay, this, this figure, this figure is published. Okay. And now this one uh, in preparation. Also, I'm considering normalized velocity profile method. Uh, okay, and this is in preparation. Uh, I probably submit this next week or so. So that will appear on archive in a week or so. So here I'm showing the uh, V tilde as a function of a normalized radius rather than radius itself. Okay, then you can see there is a, a this, this is a median, uh, the elevation. Just the natural elevation in, in this spinning. And now, uh, Indran uh, actually suggested this uh, kinematic cut. Okay. Actually, he criticized my work based on this kinematic cut. So I applied this kinematic cut. So red are uh, uh, not satisfying kinematic cut and blue are satisfying kinematic cut. Then uh, you can see. A blue data point that satisfying kinematic cut that becomes flat. Uh, so uh, what Indra is uh, so agreeing with what Indra says, but now you can see here mass. The initially mass was flat. So in, in my sample, the mass didn't change uh, for the small separation and large separation, but mass increases. So. Uh, this cut actually creates a, a biased sample. So, uh, okay, so that's uh, very interesting. Okay. And now here I'm also considering a limited range. 
2 to 30 kilo AU because th this is what Indranil consult. So the sample is just 5600. Uh, so it's uh, close, uh, not the same as uh, Indranil sample that's about 8000. So it's a little smaller than but uh, you know, the order of magnitude. So in this case, the range is uh, quite small compared to this. Now, uh, the result. So in this meaning, I calculated Newtonian prediction that those are flat, uh, those are blue. So without kinematic cut, the data is rising as what Indra showed, and the Newtonian prediction is flat. So there is a clear Mondo signal. Now Indra suggests uh, we must apply this kinematic cut, then the data becomes flat, red. But because mass, uh, th this sample is biased, mass decreases. That's why Newtonian prediction also changes. So uh, you see, there is uh, some change, but uh, the conclusion is not changed. You know, Mund is uh, still preferred. Now, what Indra does is they consider only this uh, narrow range that's shown here. So. If you consider only this narrow range, then actually the shapes, the shapes of two curves are similar. So you have you, you lose most of the power. In this case, you can see the change in the shape, but here, uh, if, if you consider narrow range, you cannot see the change. And and now I fixed the the, the value in the range used 0.65. Then I get Newton free for the result. Wow. So I reproduced Indra's result with my sample, although the sample is slight difference. So, and now this, uh, uh, this new sample also won the free for And now this is for pure binary. And uh, this work was undertaken before Indra's work was released. So uh, it has nothing to do with the, uh, the response to Indra's paper. It was just uh, tried uh, just uh, uh, earlier. And then uh, you can see for this pure binary sample, in this case, actually there are no fitting. You know, F multi is just assumed to be zero. So there is no fitting. And then you can see this higher acceleration data naturally satisfy Newton, but low acceleration data clearly deviate. And then interestingly, it agrees with just a, a generic aqua prediction. And also this one shows uh, just a, a stacked velocity profile. And these two are completely uh, agreeing with each other. And now here I'm actually mentioning some the, the key uh, problems with uh, Indra's uh, methodology. The, the first one is they use this narrow range where there is uh, only weak discriminating power. Okay. And also they did this uh, binning and then they calculated occupancies. Uh, and then uh, one thing they need to do is uh, they need to consider probably S over R. Uh, R sky over RLM rather than R sky. And that's more sensible. And also these uh, cell sizes must be larger than the uncertainties of V tilde. Okay, and then these are the, the uh, references. So uh, people are wondering, and some YouTubers are actually uh, giving false reports, but I suggest you to do analysis yourself. It is a certain. Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah. questions? Actually, we have no more time left. So the short time. Yes, Eric, fabulous, you can see. I was clapping, so I just wanted to say thanks very much for this wonderful presentation. Yeah. I think it's very convincing. Um, yes. So we have a lot of questions. Yeah, Frederick. Yes, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, of course, my question is uh, implying my, my work, which is a surrounding model, 
which is a modified graffiti model. Uh, uh, my, my model requires, uh, my model predicts, sorry, uh, something different from Newton's law, slightly different, but it depends of the location of the white binary. If the white binary is far, uh, uh, sorry, if the, white, if, the, if the white binary is located in the direction of the, of the galactic center, then it's the, uh, the result which is opposite uh, to the case in which the white binary is uh, in the direction of the outer space. So uh, uh, my question would be, uh, is there any way in your work to have uh, isotropic, uh, an you know, anisotropic uh, result? Uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, two, two, two parts, a white binary which are uh, in the di di direction of outer space, and from one part, and from what's the second part, uh, the white binary, which are in the direction of the galactic center. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'm clear enough. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, if we go to larger distances, uh, I mean, to do that kind of uh, test, uh, we need to go to larger distances. We need to consider binaries at larger distance, large distances. I mean, it, this sample is uh, uh, within 200 parsec. So they are in the, within the thin disk. Yeah, or they are thin disk. So actually we don't see much uh, difference. Basically, uh, you can just consider a local, uh, local neighborhood, local solar neighborhood. Uh, so if you want to uh, test that kind of some uh, space uh, anisotropy, then uh, we need to go actually outside the disk, uh, at least more than probably one, one kiloparsec, and also one kiloparsec to the direction of the uh, galactic center. Then actually uh, data, you know, become uh you know less accurate less precise you know if you go larger distance and data become less precise so uh i mean in in principle we can do statistical analysis you know whatever the precision you have you can do some statistical analysis but the the, the precision become uh, uh, when the precision gets lower then you know statistical analysis becomes messy so yeah Yes, thank you. All right. Maurice, want to ask something? Yes, mention something in chat. Uh, yes, and the, uh, the question is, of course, you want to connect whatever you may be finding in white binaries with what is happening in spiral galaxies, because that's the most studied. Um, in the uh, spiral galaxies based on Spark, uh, I find that the transition between Newtonian and anomalous gravity that ultimately asymptotes to Milgram's law is amazingly accurately right at uh, the decidus scale of acceleration defined by the product of the velocity of light and the Hubble parameter. So I was wondering if you are able to identify the same critical ADS for the transition in this uh, in this study. Well. I, you know, uh, here I just uh, quantified the deviation from Newton. Okay, here actually there is no calculation of uh, modified gravity uh, whatsoever. As I said earlier, if data agreed Newton, then that would have been the end of the analysis. So. These are just purely... No, but the point is, this, the, what I'm saying is entirely phenomenological. Yeah, yeah, so, it does not depend yeah, on any model. So, yeah, yeah, so you can use... The, these are purely data. So you can use this data to test whatever you want. Yeah, but why don't you do a test by dividing the horizontal axis by... Yeah. Yes, then it's much easier to read off. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that, but... Uh, uh, I need to first uh, sort out this uh, analysis uh, more, and then after that, I can, you know, uh, 
look out uh, to, I mean, I can broaden the analysis to other more specific uh, models like yours. Yeah, so uh, there is well, again, this is yeah. not a model statement. This is a phenomenological observation. I may have a model for it, but it's a separate discussion. Okay. All right, Xavier wants to ask something. Javier wants to ask something. Javier? Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I just wanted to mention that in my most uh, most recent study, which is uh, on, a, which I just printed here in, in the chat, it's in the, uh, about to be published in Monte Notices, um, I include a full uh, analysis of the VTL, the distributions, the actual distributions. And um, the model that I that I tested there was explicitly one which is Newtonian at all scales, but uh, the um, the effective value of G is allowed to vary. So it's basically a, a sort of a maximum likelihood uh, recovery of what the value of G might be at the different regimes. And um, just like uh, like uh, what Key was showing, uh, I, I find uh, completely consistency in, in the sense that. Um, in the high acceleration regime, uh, which is uh, absent from uh, Indra Neil's uh, papers, in, in the uh, small separations, we find uh, that the uh, effective value of the gravitational constant is exactly the Newtonian value. So the the, the scale of the scale the scaling of G there is is one, and uh, in the low acceleration regime, uh, the scaling I find is exactly. Uh, well, I mean, with a high precision, 1.5. So a 50% increase in, in, in the effective value of G. Um, so, I mean, to answer, uh, to try and answer Maurice's question, uh, th that's kind of the uh, the gravity models that have been tested. And and that's what we see here in, in, Q's, uh, in, in Q's latest plot to the right. You know? We see a, a sort of little, uh, we, we see the uh, the same sort of Newtonian, or uh, so let's say Keplerian, uh, curve in the in both uh, in both regimes. Once you are in the uh, what he's calling the boosted regime, there's a transition where, where things sort of change from one to the other. But both in the Newtonian and the boosted regimes, you find uh, Keplerian uh, r to the minus one half falls, but yeah. with a little uh, with a little extra scaling. Um, I think what's now going to be extremely interesting is to look at exactly what's going on in, in that transition function. Obviously, uh, the details of that transition are harder to uh, to quantify because you have fewer stars. Um, and uh, particularly if you want to be very precise and uh, and and use extremely high quality cuts where uh, all sorts of kinematic contaminants have been weeded out, and then you're actually looking at gravity rather than a refraction of hidden binary, hidden tertiaries and uh, flybys and so on. So, uh, so yes, I, I, to summarize, I just would like to point out the uh, uh, complete uh, uh, concordance between my results and um, and and Q's through the use of highly independent sample selection and statistical analysis. And in my view, the uh, the, the current sort of uh, open questions in this in this in this uh, line of research uh, in terms of what exactly is going on with the transition. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, if I can comment on that, this is exactly what uh, I've been advertising in 2018 by simply comparing uh, Spark data with Merck S2 data. And then what is really striking, if you plot it in a normalized plot, so you plot uh, horizontally the expected Newtonian acceleration divided by the De Sitter scale, and vertically you plot the expected Newtonian based on the observed radial acceleration, then you actually you 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 see a striking uh, result in that there is a six sigma deviation between the two, and you find a sharp C zero transition, which of course cannot be explained by dark matter. And on top of that, that the location of that transition is exactly at the the city scale of acceleration, which of course is an invitation to also take this to higher redshifts. Um, but I find this uh, basically. Uh, a, a really strong indicator that this should be taken seriously because if this is real something about gravity then it should be universal so that's why uh, you would definitely expect this to see this fingerprint also in the white binaries if indeed what of course many of us hope the the anomaly you see in white binaries is the same 
uh, anomaly, as you see in uh, in Spark and uh, Spiral Galaxies. And it's the universality, I think, that ultimately will give meaning to this. Exactly. Yeah, that, that, that's why the original idea here was uh, to get away from rotation curves, because there you can always argue that you're looking at uh, feedback and complicated galaxy formation issues, the presence of dark matter and so on. So the idea was to take uh, a low acceleration system, which might, uh, which could be as far removed in every sense from the galactic phenomenology and see if uh, that universality was preserved or not. And over the past year or the past few months, as, as Q was saying, uh, we have indeed confirmed this universality in, in the sort of Mond phenomenology appearing at uh, uh, low accelerations. Yeah, so thank you. Yes, uh, but the canonical Mond uh, picture doesn't uh, elucidate the nature of the, uh, the sharp C0 transition uh, in the transition from Newtonian to anomalous gravity. So that, that's an added uh, piece of phenomenology that I think is crucial. Thank you. Uh, simply thank because, you. Let, if I can add one more comment, because that can actually identify that you have a finite sensitivity to the background uh, cosmology. And that, of course, is a very open question. It's left open in the Milgram's approach where you have an A0 and you don't know where it comes from. Uh, but if the transition is exactly at the background to the city scale, then, of course, you have evidence that it's actually tracing uh, background cosmology. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. I, I think the uh, yeah, we most have to, uh, we have to end this conversation because our next speaker is waiting. So yeah, well, thank you so much. But yeah, thank you, Kyuhan. So I would like to invite Victor T. Thoth uh, from Perimeter Institute of Theoretical Physics. Uh, his uh, title of the talk is "From Stellar Systems to the CMB: Mog Across 15 Plus Orders of Magnitude." Uh, Victor. Very good. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Very well. Let me start sharing. Just one second, please. Just one second, please. And you should be seeing my slides. Yeah. Yeah, we are seeing it. Very good. Yeah. So, uh, as you said, I have been asked to talk about MOG, uh, Modified Gravity, also known as STVG, Scalar Tensor Vector Gravity. This theory was uh, was invented, I should say, uh, by John Moffat from the Perimeter Institute. I worked with John uh, on and off on this theory for the past, uh, I guess, 18 years now. It's a fascinating theory with a fascinating history. So very, very briefly, as, as those of you who know John, you, you know that he has been around for a very long time and he met some very interesting people in, in, in this field. In, uh, starting with his famous letter to Einstein back in the 1950s that started his career as a physicist and he's still active. So his theory was conceptually uh, rooted in Einstein's original attempt to create a non-symmetric theory that would that would classically unify uh, gravity with electromagnetism. And of course, we know that doesn't work. But John's take, I hope I'm not paraphrasing him too much, uh, John's take was that uh, that maybe the anti-symmetric part of a, of a generic theory is is not Maxwell's theory. It's 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 a, an additional contribution to gravity. So thus uh, came in the 1990s his first theory, which was called MGT, non-symmetric gravitational theory, and uh, there were some stability issues with that MGT. So he moved on to. Uh, to basically separating the non-symmetric tensor as a, as, a, as a field on its own right that led to matrix U tensor gravity. And of course, a well-behaved non-symmetric tensor is just the exterior derivative of a vector field, so why not just make it a vector theory? And thus, uh, STVG, scalar tensor vector the uh, gravity, was born back in 2006, coincidentally, uh, just around the same time when I first met John at a conference on the Pioneer Anomaly. So... One thing about MOG, it's a proper classical field theory. It's not like a, a it's not just some, some, some effective uh, equation of acceleration or modified uh, uh, dynamics. It is a proper theory rooted in, in a field theory Lagrangian. Originally, John uh, created a theory that had a vector field and three scalar fields. He told me half jokingly, half seriously that, uh, that uh, when you create a new theory, you have to make sure that everything is in there because otherwise somebody will add another element and what will happen then, it will be their theory, not yours. 
So the point is, uh, it turns out that what we really need to model uh, systems from 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 stellar scales all the way up to cosmology is really just one scalar degree of freedom. So the way I wrote down the Lagrangian here in this uh, in this um, on this slide, I kind of grade out the second field that uh, the dynamics of which uh, we really don't seem to be interested in. So to tell you uh, basically what you see here in, in the form of this Lagrangian, just the standard Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian and a massive vector field. And the mass of the vector field itself is variable, but that variation is constrained. Originally, the mu field that was the mass of the vector field was considered uh, a dynamical scalar field on its own right. But now we pretty much believe that it is part of the of the one and only scalar term, which is a Brans Dickey type uh, uh, um, variable gravitational constant term. However, we write down uh, the Lagrangian. So the bottom line is that we have a theory with a massive vector field and uh, a variable gravitational constant that also affects the effective mass of that vector field. And this leads us to an acceleration law that is kind of a Yukawa type acceler acceleration law. And allow me to explain what it really means. When you look at the R double dot expression on this slide, the one plus alpha tie apart corresponds to an enhanced gravitational constant. So instead of G Newton, we have one plus alpha times G Newton. But then it is canceled out to the tune of alpha by a repulsive vector field. So that means that at short range, we actually see a theory that is Newtonian. We are just end up with GM over R squared, GM, uh, G, uh, GM over R squared. But at larger distances, the Yukawa part, which is massive, has a finite range. It diminishes, it disappears, and there is a relatively sharp transition to an enhanced gravitational constant. And the parameters of the theory are that this transition typically occurs on the scale of spiral galaxies. So as such, the theory is, of course, you know, in a sense, designed in response to the observed uh, uh, galaxy rotation curve. So it's perhaps no surprise that uh, that uh, that its predictions uh, uh, work on the scale of galaxies. However, the one thing uh, about a modified gravity theory today is that it has to work all the way from the solar system to cosmology across at least uh, 15 orders of magnitude. It's not enough to simply explain galaxy rotation curves. There is also precision of observation in the solar system, again, all the way up to cosmological observations like the, the, the angular power spectrum. So how can a theory do that? And um, of course, uh, well, I'm not touching right now the issue of white binaries. I mean, that was a very interesting presentation, by the way, and thank you very much. Uh, I understand there are uh, some contrarian views as well. Allow me to just ignore that for now, not because I'm ignoring it, it's because I'm really not prepared to, to make informed comments on that, on that uh, subject. Uh, the point about MOG is that unlike MOD, which has an acceleration scale, MOG basically scales with mass or, or range. So the two theories provide similar results on galactic scales. But uh, on other scales, there is a deviation between the predictions. So in a sense, you know, this might actually lead to observational tests that might distinguish the two classes of theories from one another. As I said, the theory has to work across uh, many orders of magnitude. And uh, in the case of MOG, uh, we pretty much predict no deviation for smaller systems. We have done a study uh, many years ago uh, on, on, on globular clusters. And we found that uh, globular clusters, regardless of size and regardless of density, appear to be Newtonian. And uh, that basically means that even at very at very low accelerations, there is no apparent deviation from Newtonian behavior in, in, in the velocity dispersions of these clusters. So that seems to, to conflict perhaps with the bi white binaries, but it also it also seems to agree with the MOG, which pretty much predicts that alpha that famous parameter that that uh, characterizes deviation from Newtonian physics is is very close to zero for small systems. It only starts to kick in for systems that are at least ten to the seven solar masses or larger. And uh, when it kicks in, the interesting thing is that in a characteristic range uh, uh, <clears throat> characterized by 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 r equals inverse mu. Uh, the mod behavior is pretty much the Tully Fisher relationship. So it, it, it actually offers rotation curves that are, that, uh, that, uh, that are consistent with uh, spiral galaxy observations. 
On smaller scales, again, we expect no significant deviation from Newtonian behavior. This would be in conflict probably with the white binaries, but uh, let me reserve judgment on that. On the scale of galaxies, MOG actually has some very, very robust uh, predictions of rotation curves that, that agree with observational data. Here I included some slides from our published papers, including, including the, 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 the um, famous NGC 1277, which is a massive galaxy, but very compact. And because it is very compact, the range is so small that, that it's, 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 <coughs> That it's, uh, uh, the behavior, uh, the mock behavior is still, still Newtonian in that regime because it would only kick in at larger distances from the, from the center of mass of that galaxy. Moving on, uh, beyond galaxies, there is galaxy clusters. And of course, one of the big challenges for modified gravity was the bullet cluster and the idea that we have a separation of, of, of gas, uh, dark matter and stellar matter in ways that is supposedly hard to, to explain for a modified gravity theory. But then again, there was also Abel uh, 520, which uh, seemed to prove the opposite. Now, John, uh, John Moffat and his uh, then, uh, then um, um, a student, uh, Joel Brownstein, did a study back in the mid-2000s where they showed that the way the MOG uh, repulsive acceleration kicks in, it is actually consistent with the with the lensing map uh, uh, of, of the bullet cluster. And uh, later we also did another study where we showed that ABO 520 is also is also consistent with the MOG prediction. So these do not seem to be to be a significant challenges to MOG. MOG seems to work well on 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 the scale of clusters. And going beyond clusters, that's when it gets really interesting because um, there are, of course, um, the uh, cosmological observations that we need to worry about, which is the 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 um, the matter power spectrum, large scale distribution, statistical distribution of matter in the in in the cosmos, and also the angular power spectrum of of uh, the CMB. And it turns out that on both counts, uh, MOG behaves pretty well. Uh, Concerning the, the matter power spectrum, uh, a theory with no dark matter would predict in principle the famous unit oscillations, baryonic oscillations. But when you look at how the data are actually collected and analyzed, binned uh, using, using, using um, uh, pairs of, for instance, um, uh, uh, red galaxies, uh, what we see is that the binning itself uh, wipes out a lot of the apparent oscillation and much larger samples would be required to see the, magni the actual magnitude of the oscillations. Here in the plot, in the left side plot on this slide, uh, on this slide you can actually see that, uh, that um, the data is pretty flat and the red curve that is the mock prediction, which does show some oscillation at the level of this particular binning, seems to be in, in decent agreement. So the point is that that uh, that for now, uh, I, I think the matter power spectrum is not quite sensitive enough to rule out uh, dark matter free theory, whether it is MOG or, or, or whatever else. And on the cosmology side, there is of course now the famous Planck observations, uh, the 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 I remember I was actually at the Parameter Institute when uh, when um, eighteen years ago uh, the third peak was observed unambiguously in 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 uh, the WMAP data and everybody was very excited. Well, it turns out that uh, that the mock prediction for uh, for the uh, uh, for the angular power spectrum is very similar to the standard uh, lambda CDM prediction. So again, we seem to be faring reasonably well with respect to that. So what I'm trying to say with all this is that MOG appears to work uh, uh, quite well across all those 15 orders of magnitude. Having said that, I also wanted to mention a few challenges that uh, I personally find important. Uh, for starters, when we look at the equations of motion for test particle, we basically uh, uh, postulate a test particle uh, uh, Lagrangian separate from the theory because of course MOG is not a theory of matter like Einstein's theory, just a theory of the gravitational field. How uh, that field interacts with matter is of course quite important. I'm actually working on something on, 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 on that front. Now, in the solar system, it's one thing to be able to predict Newtonian behavior, but in the solar system, we also have very stringent post-Newtonian uh, data 
everything you know from 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 Cassini, from uh, planetary uh, uh, radar ranging, from lunar laser range, ranging. So we have to be able to meet all those criteria. The the scalar parameters of the mock theory alpha and mu. We have a derivation that that makes alpha and mu dependent on m the mass of the source, but this derivation is kind of heuristic and we would like to see a much more robust uh, theoretical relationship between, between the source mass and these critical parameters of the theory. Having said that, one point in, in favor of MOG is that unlike several other theories, MOG is not a biometric theory, which means that its uh, predictions with respect to multi-messenger observations like uh, neutron star mer mergers are pretty robust because uh, Mog, Mog predicts the same propagation velocity for gravitational waves and 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 light. So the same issue that affected a number of gravitational theories that uh, postulated multiple metrics, Mog uh, fares rather well on those ones. So that's pretty much it. I wanted to be very brief because uh, that's my allotted time. So thank you very much for listening and let me know if there are any questions. Thank you, Victor. It was nice presentation. Um, Thank so you. questions? Yes, we can't. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. So, uh, in fact, I've uh, worked on a couple of papers in mock, and I would like to ask this question. How many dynamical degrees of freedom does this theory have? When you say four, because once I asked this question to Professor John Mossad itself, and by looking at the Lagrangian, we know that it's four, but he mentioned it is three. So I'm just confused whether it has three dynamical degrees of freedom or four. It has one vector degree of freedom. And in the original formulation, it had three scalar degrees of freedom. We okay. discussed with one of them early on because it was not necessary. And I am in favor of also dispensing with one other because there seems to be an, a constraint, an algebraic relationship between the alpha and mu parameters. So if I'm right, then 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 we have one vector degree of freedom and one scalar degree of freedom. So the mass of the scalar field is not taken into account. Uh, oh, sorry, the mass of the vector field. The, the mass of the vector field would would have, would have an algebraic relationship with the alpha parameter, which also de determines the strength of the gravitational coupling constant. So again, the okay. same scalar degree of freedom governs both. Uh, uh, okay, so, so th there have been some earlier constraints for the galaxy rotation curves in like 2013 with uh, Moffat and Rauer paper. So mm -hmm. the same paper, uh, the yeah, this equation, this accelerator equation has been used and the constraints have been obtained for this alpha and mu. So yeah. is it still valid or this uh, constraint relation between alpha and mu reduce this theory to this acceleration related to something else? I, I believe that, that the equations that you see on this very slide, uh, which basically imply an, an algebraic relationship between alpha and mu, that the those are at least approximately valid, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Eric, you can answer. Yes, um, when you're fitting the uh, galaxy rotation curves, are you fitting the radio data for the rotation of the gas or the optical data for the rotation of the stellar? mass because there have been quite a few studies over the last two years showing that uh, the stars, the rotation curve of the stars in the Milky Way and nearby galaxies turns downward while the rotation curve of the gas is flat. So which one are you fitting? Allow me to evade that question because honestly i don't remember i have lost work on on galaxy rotation curves specifically more than 10 years ago so i would have to consult our own papers and the papers that john published with 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 sorab to be able to uh, to answer your question correctly so allow me to 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 not answer simply i don't remember i mean that's my honest answer <laughs> okay. well i i can say that if it's 10 years ago it's probably the radio data because, uh, you're you're right. Again, I just don't want to say right. one or another since since simply I'm I'm I don't know. <laughs> no, I understand. But the significance is 
the gas is clearly affected by magnetic fields as well as gravitational. So that, yeah. that uh, can explain the flat curves uh, independently of, of the laws of gravity. But thanks anyway. Thank you. Yeah, Xavier? Yes, uh, ha hello, I have a couple of questions. The first is that, um, well, I, I find MOG, the MOG idea in general quite interesting, uh, although there's obviously, um, I, I think, uh, a problem with uh, with the small scales uh, and the way the uh, the modification um, disappears at, at low mass scales, uh, below 10 to the 7. I think there is, uh, beyond the uh, the white binary, substantial evidence of um, uh, extremely high mass to light ratios reported for, say, the ultra-faint uh, dwarf galaxies, which are below, well below 10 to the 7 solar masses, and apparently exhibit uh, in a classical picture substantial amounts of, uh, of, of dark matter. So I was wondering if the, uh, um, the other vector fields that have been removed could possibly help uh, extending this sort of uh, gravitational anomaly down to smaller masses. And then uh, finally, uh, my second point is that uh, you mentioned contrarian results regarding the white binaries. Uh, as Q showed, um, the uh, error structure and uh, statistical method used in, in uh, by Indranil in his latest paper are internally inconsistent. Uh, this is something which I'm sure Andre Indranil, who's here, can confirm. And I wanted to ask Indranil, taking the opportunity that he's here, if he uh, has any intention of repeating the um, uh, the study, but uh, addressing this serious point. Thank you. I'm not sure I fully really understood your second question. Well, my second question was really aimed at uh, Indranil, I suppose. Well, uh, mainly, well, first uh, to make a point that uh, these contrarian views uh, are are uh, are uh, based on a paper which uh, which is internally inconsistent. The the error. Uh, uh, structure of the uh, data being used is inconsistent with the statistical method, uh, details of the statistical method being applied. So that's that's, that's a point I would make sort of generally. Mm -hmm. um, and my first question was, uh, what what happens with other substantial evidence for uh, gravitational anomalies in systems at masses below 10 to the 7, like ultra-faint dwarfs? Well, let me, let me comment on that in a, in a strictly like my personal take. I am I'm I'm bit uh, I, I'm always puzzled by 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 ultra faint galaxies and the data because the data seem to be all over the place. There are some ultra diffuse galaxies that seem to be um, I forgot the name almost Newtonian behavior or Newtonian behavior. There are extreme mass to light ratios, and I could never escape the thought, you know, like how certain are we that these are proper virialized systems that are, that are good tests for gravitation? I mean, this is independent of MOG or MOND or any particular theory. I mean, are these good laboratories of, of, of studying dynamical behavior of undisturbed systems? So that's one of my concerns con uh, regarding that data. The other concern I have is, of course, uh, galaxies seem to support uh, SMBHs at of various sizes and, and, uh, I have to wonder, you know, like, unless we know, I mean, the same, uh, like, let's say a Sagittarius A star sized uh, SMBH means nothing in a large spiral galaxy, but in an ultra faint galaxy completely alters the dynamics of that system. So what I'm trying to say is that, that I, I always wonder, you know, like, if the data are as all over the place as it is, that could be a strong point in favor of dark matter because it's very difficult to ha find a consistent uh, relationship that would cover all all the observational um, um, uh, items, all the all the all the observational uh, samples. So I'm not trying to ignore that that data, but I am I'm of two minds. You know, how seriously should we take them as challenges to modify gravity in general? And uh, again, if I take them as face value, that would be a very strong point in favor of dark matter, because otherwise I see no consistent rule or, 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 or behavior across all those systems. And one, one, one other point on that one, again, we studied uh, uh, globular clusters, and uh, those clusters are sometimes more massive than some of these, uh, these uh, ultra-diffuse galaxies, yet show no deviation or no apparent deviation from Newtonian gravity. 
So how would how would we how would we deal with that? So again, my personal take is that the ultra diffuse galaxies, I would like to see much firmer assurance that they are good laboratories for gravitational dynamics. Okay, I, I understand. I was talking mostly of the ultra faint rather than the ultra diffuse. Uh, well, in a sense, it's uh, I'm, uh, the same thing. Yeah. They are kind of, kind of. I mean, I'm not try trying to say they are the same objects. I mean, the, sa the, the, the same question arises: how uh, how good are they as laboratories of of of, of uh, to, to test gravitational dynamics? How how firmly do we know that these are undisturbed, virialized systems? That's the fundamental question. All right. Uh, Pierre Francisco, so we have lo too much time. Uh, yeah, so I had I had pretty much the same question as Xavier. Uh, so I, my second question on better command would be, but does MOG include something like uh, the external field effect as in MOG, which could in principle be used to justify the fact that you have this apparently contradictory result on uh, ultra faint galaxies, dark matter dominated or without dark matter. How do you comment on that? No, MOG has no external field effect. Everything that you see is in, in, in the MOG Lagrangian is there. It's uh, again, it's basically just a, a combination of a, of a tensor theory with a variable coupling constant and, uh, and, 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 and the vector field. To the extent an external field might be present, well, uh, you know, if the scalar field is is what it is because of the uh, uh, because a system is embedded in another system, you could consider that. But that's basically captured in the theory. So there is no there is no uh, heuristic external field effect that would be added to this acceleration law. Now, the acceleration law exists as it is presented here for systems in isolation. But, hmm. uh, but uh, so no, anyhow, the answer is there is no EFE. Okay, okay, okay. Srikant, okay. so want to ask something? Or... Yes, if, if there is time. So I, I, I have this question about the constants in this slide, like D and E. Are they universal constants or because in some papers claim to claim them to be some kind of real actual constants or but in few other papers like I have seen that a different values for these parameters have been used. So uh, in, in in my take, um, D, E and G infinity that you see on this page are three universal constants that that basically govern uh, govern the the uh, the theory. So essentially they are integration constants that should be absolutely universal. Yeah. So Q you want yeah, to okay. okay. Q and Cha wants to ask something. Okay, uh, so the even even the, the relativistic mode is considered to be a phenomenological model. So uh, I, I would like to ask you first, uh, what's your view of your model, or what, I mean, what level of fundamental uh, you know theory do you think? And uh, uh, in relation to that, uh, can you somehow modify? this model to uh, to make your model agree with the uh, white binary results. I mean, my white binary results. The mock theory is a proper classical field theory. So it's not a quantum field theory, may, may or may not be amenable to quantization, but it is a proper Lagrangian uh, field theory. As to your question, how it could be modified? That's a darn good question because for starters, uh, the original formulation of MOG, as I mentioned, is, is essentially a formulation of a gravitational theory without any regard as to the behavior of matter. So matter is basically defined in the theory as the thing that when it's, when we take its variation with respect to the metric tensor, gives T mu nu that goes to, onto the right hand side of Einstein field equations. And that's the only thing we know about matter. Except that, of course, we do need to know that matter couples with 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 a, with a strength of 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 a one plus a one plus alpha, alpha into g newton to the tensor field and with a strength uh, uh, proportional to alpha to the vector field, so maybe we do know a little bit more about how matter and the fields of mog uh, 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 
interact and behave. And uh, that turns it turn, turns into something rather difficult. Now, in, in his 2006 paper, when, when John first proposed the STVG theory, he basically postulated a test particle by writing down a separate test particle Lagrangian, which is a very reasonable thing to do. But the question that becomes, can we incorporate that into, into, a, into, a, into a better formulation where we basically tell what the variation of matter fields would be like with respect to all the mock degrees of freedom? And there is some latitude there. We can indeed, you know, like basically postulate a theory and its interaction with, with, with generic matter fields, like let's say a perfect fluid uh, matter field. And uh, it is indeed conceivable that uh, that uh, sm uh, keeping the essence of the theory as is, but uh, but introducing a small modification or a tweak of how it interacts with matter, it might indeed be possible to accommodate uh, uh, observations on the scale of a few thousand astronomical units. I am I am kind of on the fence on that one. I hope you will forgive me. I know it's a new result. It's very interesting, and I very much appreciated your presentation. I'm kind of on the fence on this because, in a sense, I've seen this before. I worked on the Pioneer Anomaly 20 years ago, and there was a great deal of excitement that hey, we see some small deviation from 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 uh, from Newtonian physics at 100 AU, and it turned out to be nothing. So I'm kind of, you know, kind of like, let's see and wait. My attitude is, you know, instead of jumping a bandwagon. But if it turns out that 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 uh, that your observation is robustly confirmed, then of course a modified gravity theory will either have to die or we'll have to be able to deal with that. And I think I see a, a kind of a, a window, an opening to for for Mark to do that if if necessary. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, just a quick comment. I mean, mm -hmm. this relativistic mode theory, like uh, uh, gelosonic, I mean, I mean, scordis and gelosonic, that starts from uh, mode and then it incorporates relativistic theory. So, uh, it, uh, I mean, that those those kind of theory might work uh, actually as well as your model in terms of explaining data from small scale to up to uh, CMB data. So, uh, I mean, you, you emphasized your model agreed well from small scale to large scale, but actually, uh, you know, a Scottish and Jerusalem model uh, could say something even stronger, mm -hmm. I mean, than your model in terms of explaining data. But that's a relativistic mode theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, quick question from Kenat Arun. Uh, you are not audible. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. A uh, quick question to both uh, Victor and uh, Q, uh, since uh, he also pitched in. Uh, have you looked at uh, possibly uh, uh, testing these on uh, uh, scales like the solar system uh, uh, constraints? Uh, maybe uh, the Earth cloud objects and uh, uh, TNOs, uh, probably they will be in the Mond regime acceleration. Uh, so any comments on that? Uh, if you're asking me, um, no, we have not looked at, at uh, beyond beyond the Pioneer, we have not looked at the data on the scale of the outer solar system. No, I don't know what uh, will let me pass it on to Q to see uh, what he has to say. Oh, uh, white binaries actually cover from, uh, I mean, in my sample, uh, I used from 200 AU up to uh, 30,000 AU. So it covers a very uh, wide range of uh, uh, acceleration. And uh, uh, it uh, agrees with Newton uh, at small separation. Uh, up to about 2,000 astronomical unit, and then it deviates from Newton uh, at larger separation. So, uh, I mean, this is uh, extremely uh, strong result, and uh, it will be confirmed. Actually, I have uh, confirmed already. I myself confirmed, and also Javier confirmed. So. Uh, 
Uh, up to 2,000 astronomical units, it is Newtonian, but beyond that, it is deviation. Uh, I, I'm not sure I actually ask, uh, answered your question exactly. Uh, I mean, oh, what what's your uh, concern? Um, I was just wondering if uh, 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 these kind of results will be applicable to any uh, low acceleration uh, regime. So we should be expecting uh, 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 farthest uh, wood cloud uh, objects to be below your uh, typical MOND acceleration. So any kind of tests have been done on those gates. So, so. Uh, I mean, at, at low acceleration? Yeah. Uh, yeah, at, at low acceleration, the, uh, I mean, the Faber mentioned this uh, open cluster test there are so many tests. And also, uh, there are external field effect tests in galaxies uh, that happens at low acceleration, about uh, 10 to the minus 11 uh, meter per second squared. So the, uh, yeah, white binary is definitely uh, tested, low acceleration, uh, gravity, and also there are uh, you know, other message. And uh, all results uh, actually now converge to the moon prediction. All right, quick question by Morris. Oh. Uh, yeah, quick question. Yeah, when I look at your slide four, uh, you have a, or maybe correct me if I'm wrong, you have a time dependent Newton's constant, or it's the, the relationship is simply a sort of a renormalized. Gravitational constant. It wasn't quite clear to me. Uh, the gravitational constant in the mod theory is pretty much like it is in 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 Brand's Dicke theory. So it's it's a scalar field or governed by a scalar field. So it's not so much time dependence. It would be it would be time and space dependence. I suppose it's a four dimensional scalar field. The the acceleration law that you see on this slide is when we apply the mob theory to pretty much essentially the, the static vacuum spherical symmetric case. So in this case, uh, the the gravitational constant is going to be, it ends up being strictly dependent on the central mass. So alpha is basically a characteristic of that system that is that is a function of its mass. So there's no time dependency. Oh, okay, okay, okay. thanks. All right. All right, Victor, thanks. Yeah, the talk was incredible. So thank you again. And we move on to our next speaker, Maria Palfi from Etovos Lorand University, Budapest, Hungary. So, yes, Maria. Um, uh, Victor, can you uh, stop the screen sharing? Yeah, Victor, can you stop your screen sharing? Yes. Okay, so let me share my screen. Mm. Okay. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I am presenting our constraints on costing cosmological models from gravitational wave standard science. Our paper has just been published in the Astrophysical Journal. It may worth to mention that although I am a member of the LIGO collaboration, this is not a collaborational project. Okay. So we have already heard that the main property of costing cosmologies is that uh, the scale factor grows linearly with cosmic time and uh, that there are strictly linear and quasi-linear models. Mm. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. 
Um, so we can detect gravitational waves by uh, laser interferometer observatories. When a gravitational wave passes through the interferometer, um, its, arm, its arms will um, change in length, and uh, this will cause an interference pattern. One source of um, gravitational waves are compact binary coalescences. Considering a binary in a, cir in a circular orbit, we can write the first equation for the evolution of the frequency. The chirp mass is the only um, unknown parameter here. The chirp mass is a combination of the source masses. If we fit a template to the gravitational wave signal, we can determine the chirp mass with high precision. And uh, if we are able to measure both um, amplitudes of the polarizations of the gravitational um, wave signal, then we can determine this yota, which is the angle between the normal of the orbital plane and the direction of um, the line of sight. Because this phi t is the integral of the, of the orbital frequency over the duration of the measurement. So then uh, we can calculate the luminosity distance without the need of a distance calibrator. Therefore, we can call these gravitational wave events standard silence. Bright silence have identified electromagnetic counterparts and uh, host galaxies, while dark silence have no identified electromagnetic counterparts. Now that we have the luminosity distance of the source, we also need the redshift to calculate the Hubble constant. But there is a degeneracy between the redshift and the source masses. Therefore, we cannot obtain the redshift information from the gravitational uh, wave data. If we have a bright side, then we can measure the redshift of um, its um, host galaxy by electromagnetic measurements. For dark sirens, we can break this degeneracy by using galaxy catalogs. Then the prior on redshift comes from the distribution of galaxies in the catalog. The GW Cosmo pipeline uses this technique and Bayesian statistics to calculate the posterior on the Hubble constant. In our paper, we constrained alternative cosmological models with gravitational wave standard silence for the first time. We tested both strict linear and quasi-linear costing cosmologies up to redshift 0 0.8. We fixed the curvature parameter to be minus 1, 0, and plus 1 to test different uh, geometries. When the curvature parameter is fixed, the Hubble constant is the only fitting parameter. Here you can see the expression of luminosity distance. Um, we have changed um, this equation in the GW Cosmo pipeline. We only used publicly available data and codes and we followed the main GW Cosmo analysis of the, of the O3 cosmology paper of the LIGO Virgo Cagra collaboration. We weighted the galaxies according to their K band luminosities. This means that uh, a galaxy that, uh, that, galaxy, that galaxies that are more luminous 
in the K-band are more likely hosts of gravitational wave events. And uh, we use the power law the Pallas peak model to describe the primary mass distribution of black holes. Here you can see the posterior distributions of the Hubble constant for the dark sirens and uh, for GW170817, which is the only bright siren. The black curve shows the posterior distribution in the lambda CDM model. And uh, this vertical blue line and the area comes from the differential age method, which uh, is used to constrain the Hubble constant in coasting cosmologies independent, independently of the curvature parameter. We fit the latest set of measurement to obtain this value of the Hubble constant. For the GW170817, we only pl plotted the differences between the, the results and the posterior distribution of um, the lambda CDM model. This figure shows um, the combined posterior distribution for all events. We can see that uh, the, the, there is a shift towards the lower values of the Hubble constant with larger values of the curvature parameter. In the summary table, um, we can see that uh, the results are consistent within one sigma with the differential age method measurement for all three geometries. And um, the logarithm of uh, the base factor, base factors between the coasting cosmologies and the lambda CDM model is in the order of 10 to the minus 8. This practic practically means that all four tested cosmo cosmological models fit equally well to the applied set of data. Mm, finally, here you can see our main conclusions again. And um, with more gravitational wave events and uh, more complete galaxy catalogs and uh, more sophisticated um, pipelines, we will be able to put tighter constraints on the Hubble constant and potentially rule out the inconsistent cosmological models. Thank you for your attention. I will try to answer your questions. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Uh, questions? Yeah, Indranil, yes. Oh, hello. Um, I was wondering if you can go uh, a bit more into like how, how exactly this differential age measurement comes about, like what exactly goes into it? Okay, so I uh, didn't do that part of uh, the work, but uh, these... Um, so that's a constraint on the age of the universe or... And that, that's a constraint on the Hubble constant. So, it's a, it's, I, if, so if I understand correctly, it's a constraint on the change in age of the universe for a fixed change in redshift. Is, is that what mm. it's doing? So this model uses... Because um, it is quite a precise constraint, which seems to strongly favor the Planck cosmology, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, this model, uh, this method uses um, um, could theories I, of... Yeah, could yeah, I yeah. maybe attempt? I think, I think what, what they're doing is, it's actually very clever. So I think they're looking at a galaxy um, and... Yes. Uh, in the age of the galaxy from the stellar population, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and, and so yeah. they can 
right? Uh, and so they get an age at a given redshift um, and can relate that to the age of the universe. Um, and you can also like check the gradient between the age and the redshift, so presumably okay, the age. Exactly. Yeah, precisely. But but the, the drawback there is that um, the stellar population in the galaxy might not be the same at every redshift simply because the uh, IMF, the initial mass function, might depend on the physical conditions. So uh, it would have been different at a high redshift when typically uh, the gas clouds were lower metallicity, perhaps uh, denser, so they would have formed... But the, if you're looking only like between redshift zero and a half, this shouldn't arise, I guess. Nearby universe, it should be more or less um, very similar, except that massive galaxies would would have a systematically different stellar population than lower mass galaxies. So there yeah. are some, some additional issues uh, which uh, would be important in the in the future to address. Um, yeah, but it's very interesting isn't it, that it prefers like the Planck cosmology, like seems to completely exclude the risk value. But yeah, that's the uh, answer, answer my question. Right. Any more questions? Any comment or questions? Okay, then um, I would like to invite Robert to have final remarks of this small discussion. And what is the picture? What is, do we have any picture of this to, you know, see okay. up? Okay. It was amazing Thank you. Uh, Thank you. meeting and the discussion was <laughs> cool. So yes, Robert, please. Thank, thank you very much for, for your words and thank you very much for the participants, the panelists and the attendees. I think that it 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 uh, has been uh, a very interesting uh, meeting uh, of a lot of discussions, ideas, and and maybe uh, future collaborations and and specific uh, uh, work teams. So next next steps, I think, is uh, summarize uh, most important conclusions of this uh, meeting and uh, maybe collect the uh, questions and answers uh, that selected by, by the panelists and, and the moderators and uh, uh, well share with uh, all the attendees uh, right, by the web and uh, work together to to continue with this line uh, plan the next uh, next uh, meeting uh, with uh, the same and, and more people of course and uh, and well, uh, um, we will keep in contact. We will keep in touch to to continue this uh, line of work. So thank you very much for for your attending. Thank you all. <laughs> so we should end this thank meeting you. right now. So yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very Recording much. Recording stopped. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. All right.